Section 23 of the Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thornston Veblen. Chapter 10 Modern Survivals of Prowess. The leisure class lives by the industrial community rather than in it. Its relations to industry are of a pecuniary rather than an industrial kind. Admission to the class is gained by exercise of the pecuniary aptitudes, aptitudes for acquisition rather than for serviceability. There is, therefore, a continued selective sifting of the human material that makes up the leisure class, and this selection proceeds on the ground of fitness for pecuniary pursuits. But the scheme of life of the class is in large part a heritage from the past, and embodies much of the habits and ideals of the earlier barbarian period. This archaic barbarian scheme of life imposes itself also on the lower orders, with more or less mitigation. In its turn the scheme of life, of conventions, acts selectively and by education to shape the human material and its action runs chiefly in the direction of conserving traits, habits, and ideals that belong to the early barbarian age, the age of prowess and predatory life. The most immediate and unequivocal expression of that archaic human nature which characterizes man in the predatory stage is the fighting propensity proper. In cases where the predatory activity is a collective one, this propensity is frequently called the martial spirit, or, latterly, patriotism. It needs no insistence to find assent to the proposition that in the countries of civilized Europe the hereditary leisure class is endowed with this martial spirit in a higher degree than the middle classes. Indeed, the leisure class claims the distinction as a matter of pride, and no doubt with some grounds. War is honorable, and warlike prowess is eminently honorific in the eyes of the generality of men, and this admiration of warlike prowess is itself the best voucher of a predatory temperament in the admirer of war. The enthusiasm for war, and the predatory temper of which it is the index, prevail in the largest measure among the upper classes, especially among the hereditary leisure class. Moreover, the ostensible serious occupation of the upper class is that of government, which, in point of origin and developmental content, is also a predatory occupation. The only class which could at all dispute with the hereditary leisure class the honor of an habitual bellicose frame of mind is that of the lower class delinquents. In ordinary times, the large body of the industrial classes is relatively apathetic touching warlike interests. When unexcited, this body of the common people, which makes up the effective force of the industrial community, is rather averse to any other than a defensive fight. Indeed, it responds a little tardily even to a provocation which makes for an attitude of defense. In the more civilized communities, or rather in the communities which have reached an advanced industrial development, the spirit of warlike aggression may be said to be obsolescent among the common people. This does not say that there is not an appreciable number of individuals among the industrial classes in whom the martial spirit asserts itself obtrusively. Nor does it say that the body of the people may not be fired with martial ardor for a time under the stimulus of some special provocation, such as is seen in operation today in more than one of the countries of Europe, and for the first time in America. But except for such seasons of temporary exaltation, and except for those individuals who are endowed with an archaic temperament of the predatory type, together with a similarly endowed body of individuals among the higher and the lowest classes, the inertness of the mass of any modern civilized community in this respect is probably so great as would make war impracticable, except against actual invasion. The habits and aptitudes of the common run of men make for an unfolding of activity in other, less picturesque directions than that of war. This class difference in temperament may be due in part to a difference in the inheritance of acquired traits in the several classes, but it seems also, in some measure, to correspond with a difference in ethnic derivation. The class difference is in this respect visibly less in those countries whose population is relatively homogeneous, ethnically, than in the countries where there is a broader divergence between the ethnic elements that make up the several classes of the community. In the same connection it may be noted that the later accessions to the leisure class in the latter countries 
in a general way show less of the martial spirit than contemporary representatives of the aristocracy of the ancient line these nouveaux arrivés have recently emerged from the commonplace body of the population and owe their emergence into the leisure class to the exercise of traits and propensities which are not to be classed as prowess in the ancient sense apart from warlike activity proper the institution of the duel is also an expression of the same superior readiness for combat and the duel is a leisure class institution the duel is in substance a more or less deliberate resort to a fight as a final settlement of a difference of opinion in civilized communities it prevails as a normal phenomenon only where there is an hereditary leisure class and almost exclusively among that class the exceptions are one military and naval officers who are ordinarily members of the leisure class and who are at the same time especially trained to predatory habits of mind and two the lower class delinquents who are by inheritance or training or both of a similarly predatory disposition and habit it is only the high-bred gentlemen and the rowdy that normally resort to blows as the universal solvent of differences of opinion the plain man will ordinarily fight only when excessive momentary irritation or alcoholic exaltation act to inhibit the more complex habits of response to the stimuli that make for provocation he is then thrown back upon the simpler less differentiated forms of the instinct of self-assertion that is to say he reverts temporarily and without reflection to an archaic habit of mind this institution of the duel as a mode of finally settling disputes and serious questions of precedence shades off into the obligatory unprovoked private fight as a social obligation due to one's good repute as a leisure class usage of this kind we have particularly that bizarre survival of bellicose chivalry the german student duel in the lower or spurious leisure class of the delinquents there is in all countries a similar though less formal social obligation incumbent on the rowdy to assert his manhood in unprovoked combat with his fellows and spreading through all grades of society a similar usage prevails among the boys of the community the boy usually knows to nicety from day to day how he and his associates grade in respect of relative fighting capacity and in the community of boys there is ordinarily no secure basis of reputability for any one who by exception will not or cannot fight on invitation all this applies especially to boys above a certain somewhat vague limit of maturity the child's temperament does not commonly answer to this description during infancy and the years of close tutelage when the child still habitually seeks contact with its mother at every turn of its daily life during this earlier period there is little aggression and little propensity for antagonism the transition from the peaceable temper to the predaceous and in extreme cases malignant mischievousness of the boy is a gradual one and it is accomplished with more completeness covering a larger range of the individual's aptitudes in some cases than in others in the earlier stage of his growth the child whether boy or girl shows less of initiative and aggressive self-assertion and less of an inclination to isolate himself and his interests from the domestic group in which he lives and he shows more of sensitiveness to rebuke bashfulness timidity and the need of friendly human contact in the common run of cases this early temperament passes by gradual but somewhat rapid obsolescence of the infantile features into the temperament of the boy proper though there are also cases where the predaceous futures of boy life do not emerge at all or at the most emerge in but a slight and obscure degree in girls the transition to the predaceous stage is seldom accomplished with the same degree of completeness as in boys and in a relatively large proportion of cases it is scarcely undergone at all in such cases the transition from infancy to adolescence and maturity is a gradual and unbroken process of the shifting of interest from infantile purposes and aptitudes to the purposes functions and relations of adult life in the girls there is a less general prevalence of a predaceous interval in the development and in the cases where it occurs the predaceous and isolating attitude during the interval is commonly less accentuated in the male child the predaceous interval is ordinarily fairly well marked and lasts for some time but it is commonly terminated if at all with the attainment of maturity this last statement may need very material qualification the cases are by no means rare in which the transition from the boyish to the adult temperament is not made nor is made only partially 
understanding by the adult temperament the average temperament of those adult individuals in modern industrial life who have some serviceability for the purposes of the collective life process and who may therefore be said to make up the effective average of the industrial community the ethnic composition of the european populations varies in some cases even the lower classes are in large measure made up of the peace disturbing dolico blonde while in others this ethnic element is found chiefly among the hereditary leisure class the fighting habit seems to prevail to a less extent among the working-class boys in the latter class of populations than among the boys of the upper classes or among those of the populations first named if this generalization as to the temperament of the boy among the working classes should be found true on a fuller and closer scrutiny of the field it would add force to the view that the bellicose temperament is in some appreciable degree a race characteristic it appears to enter more largely into the makeup of the dominant upper class ethnic type the dolico blonde of the european countries than into the subservient lower class types of men which are conceived to constitute the body of the population of the same communities the case of the boy may seem not to bear seriously on the question of the relative endowment of prowess with which the several classes of society are gifted but it is at least of some value as going to show that this fighting impulse belongs to a more archaic temperament than that possessed by the average adult man of the industrious classes in this as in many other features of child life the child reproduces temporarily and in miniature some of the earlier phases of the development of adult man under this interpretation the boy's predilection for exploit and for isolation of his own interest is to be taken as a transient reversion to the human nature that is normal to the earlier barbarian culture the predatory culture proper in this respect as in much else the leisure class and the delinquent class character shows a persistence into adult life of traits that are normal to childhood and youth and that are likewise normal or habitual to the earlier stages of culture unless the difference is traceable entirely to a fundamental difference between persistent ethnic types the traits that distinguish the swaggering delinquent and the punctilious gentleman of leisure from the common crowd are in some measure marks of an arrested spiritual development they mark an immature phase as compared with the stage of development attained by the average of the adults in the modern industrial community and it will appear presently that the puerile spiritual makeup of these representatives of the upper and the lower social strata shows itself also in the presence of other archaic traits than this proclivity to ferocious exploit and isolation as if to leave no doubt about the essential immaturity of the fighting temperament we have bridging the interval between legitimate boyhood and adult manhood the aimless and playful but more or less systematic and elaborate disturbances of the peace in vogue among schoolboys of a slightly higher age in the common run of cases these disturbances are confined to the period of adolescence they recur with decreasing frequency and acuteness as youth merges into adult life and so they reproduce in a general way in the life of the individual the sequence by which the group has passed from the predatory to a more settled habit of life in an appreciable number of cases the spiritual growth of the individual comes to a close before he emerges from the spiritual phase in these cases the fighting temper persists through life those individuals who in spiritual development eventually reach man's estate therefore ordinarily pass through a temporary archaic phase corresponding to the permanent spiritual level of the fighting and sporting men different individuals will of course achieve spiritual maturity and sobriety in this respect in different degrees and those who fail of the average remain as an undissolved residue of crude humanity in the modern industrial community and as a foil for that selective process of adaptation which makes for heightened industrial efficiency and the fullness of life of the collectivity this arrested spiritual development may express itself not only in indirect participation by adults in youthful exploits of ferocity but also indirectly in aiding and abetting disturbances of this kind on the part of younger persons it thereby furthers the formation of habits of ferocity which may persist in the later life of the growing generation and so retard any movement in the direction of a more peaceable effective temperament on the part of the community if a person so endowed with a proclivity for exploits is in a position to guide the development of habits in the adolescent members of the community the influence which he exerts in the direction of conservation and reversion to prowess may be very considerable 
this is the significance for instance of the fostering care latterly bestowed by many clergymen and other pillars of society among boys brigades and similar pseudo-military organizations the same is true of the encouragement given to the growth of college spirit college athletics and the like in the higher institutions of learning these manifestations of the predatory temperament are all to be classed under the head of exploit they are partly simple and unreflected expressions of an attitude of ferocity partly activities deliberately entered upon with a view to gaining repute for prowess sports of all kinds are of the same general character including prize fights bull fights athletics shooting angling yachting and games of skill even where the element of destructive physical efficiency is not an obtrusive feature sports shade off from the basis of hostile combat through skill to cunning and chicanery without its being possible to draw a line at any point the ground of an addiction to sports is an archaic spiritual constitution the possession of the predatory emulative propensity in a relatively high potency a strong proclivity to adventuresome exploit and to the infliction of damage is especially pronounced in those employments which are in colloquial usage specifically called sportsmanship and the first part of chapter ten